Now, question. If we were to go back to Lira, to the Italian currency, wouldn't banks be better if uh, they were nationalized? Shouldn't we have public banks only? Uh, well, you see, in principle, I would say yes. It depends on the mission given to nationalize central banks. The example not to be followed was what happened in France from 1982 to 1986 or 7. The Mitterrand regime nationalized most of banks. But why? Because private banks were bankrupt. Because of their outrageous speculation activities. But the banks being nationalized behave exactly as private banks. So it was finally a total failure. So indeed, again, it is a political question, the control of the people to the gov on the government. Next question. But I lost it. No, here it is. Well, seemingly there is a contradiction that has emerged uh, from uh, uh, your presentations. Because if it is true that the French-German axis is destroying the industrial bases in Italy and of the peaks country, if this is true, and if it is true that uh, the euro is a criminal project, uh, well, in that case, Fran France and Germany too have, in a way, forced themselves to lose um, sovereignty, monetary sovereignty. Isn't this, isn't this a contradiction? Uh, yes, but these contradictions could be explained. Indeed, we are dealing with psychotic people. But on the other side, the German and the French governments do not truly surrender their sovereignty. They entirely control the system. Surrendering their monetary sovereignty was simply the way to impose what was their core ID, destroy democracy, and I repeat myself, impose a new order they had in mind. So again, we are back to a political, a philosophical order uh, question. So there is no contradiction, I think. Germany and France were only willing to support the creation of the euro because they knew they would utterly control the ECB, the European Central Bank. Uh, yeah, in that respect, it's not inconsistent with MMT. MMT says if you give up control of your currency, you can't do certain things. You're saying they are actually still in control. There are two questions here. I think one connected to the other. The issue of uh, the phantom of the big government. Uh, uh, well, 
lira coming back to Italy, possible nationalization of banks. The Italian economy should be partly nationalized, and the state is the government's becoming too. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, somebody. So the government's getting too bulky, it's getting everywhere, it's far too large. Is that the risk of having a public mega government which is potentially less efficient than privates? There is really no. Uh, all of this talk about large government is an attempt by the banks to check and to destroy the only organ of government strong enough to control it. If planning is shifted out of the hands of government, it passes on to the hands of the banks. The banks want the planning, so they depict government as a monster, so that they can be the even bigger monster replacing the little monster. One thing that you can do in common is make sure whether the banks are public or private, they cannot be so large that they pose any systemic economic danger. And if they're smaller, they will also have less political power, even if they're, and I mean political power even if they're state-owned, the kind of power we see in France that is so destructive. So keep the banks small, whether they're public or private. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. The danger is, uh, should a possible default happen, everybody panicking and uh, piling up foreign currencies, uh, attempting to uh, create deposits in Swiss francs and the like. Do you think this might uh, cause a major problem for Italy? Uh, I don't think so. Because now, uh, I could testify that the owner of the largest fortunes in France are already anticipating a collapse of the euro, and there is an enormous outflow of capital to the United States. Banks have already calculated, computed the end of the euro. They know the system cannot survive. The question for about MMT. If the government uh, becomes the gu uh, guarantor of full employment, uh, so becoming last resort employer, what happens if uh, the government cannot fire anyone anymore, cannot lay off anyone because financial rules are very strict about that? Nobody will want to work in the private sector. Nobody will want to work in the private sector, where uh, layoffs are still possible, or at least it would be easier to lay off people. But for, while being not an official MMT, I could answer the problem of Europe is that now, without MMT, circuitist, uh, post keynesian the private European sector does not want anymore to hire people. It has been decided it will be maintained. The European corporations are no more interested in employment and the real economy. And the tragedy worse of a Greek tragedy is that government are exactly following the same situation. 
so soon, the entire population will survive on charity incomes or die. The job, the job guarantee does not give you a job that you can't get fired from. If you do not show up for work, if you are a nurse and you hurt people, you get fired. So you can lose your job. A question uh, that uh, might have been answered already, but uh, it's about uh, growth uh, cannot be never ending and infinite uh, in a destroyed world, uh, is a f in a finite world. Uh, what's the link with MMIT and how should this thing be managed? Well, the, the uh, answer is that uh, gr growth, uh, the, there are limits to growth, real resource constraints. We accept that. The primary contention of MMT is that there is not a financial constraint. We may not be able to do something because there is a shortage of a particular good or a particular resource. But that is a very different question from saying we can't do something because it's fiscally unsustainable or we can't afford it because we're going to go bust like a household. That's a completely different uh, argument. And unfortunately, the question of financial constraint is what is usually used to justify inactivity on fiscal policy. But we do recognize the existence of real resource constraints, no question. And a short comment. Because I know for a very long time the prophet of anti-growth movement, the French economist Latouche. The problem is that Mr. Latouche, a former Maoist, he now is now an advisor of Marine Le Pen. comment, if you may, on the Hungarian situation, situation in Hungary that has uh, a sovereign money, strong political majority, and uh, major problems, uh, a country in trouble, they uh, find it hard to fight back uh, the blackmails of the International Monetary Funds and the European Union. My understanding, first of all, is that the foreign is pegged to the euro. So, it's not completely sovereign. It has another problem, Hungary, which is that the country, when it was making preparations to join the European Union and ultimately become a member of the Eurozone, was told, like many other Eastern European countries, that you could just borrow in the Euros or you could borrow in Swiss francs because soon you'll be in the European Monetary Union and in any case you have a very very low rate of interest and I've seen this in many um, emerging economies they look at the interest rate and they fail to appreciate things called foreign exchange risk and in the case of Hungary you have a very high number of Swiss franc and euro denominated mortgages so this creates an additional constraint for them and this is what gives uh, the European um, Union uh, leverage over them to some extent, along with the structural uh, funds that they are promising them and now using to blackmail them. But Hungary uh, should have probably never engaged in any kind of uh, foreign debt, private foreign debt accumulation, and the foreign should be allowed to float it. It's a, it's a similar problem to what Latvia had. And Hungary's ethnic policies have removed any political allies it might have.
Any suggestions about how to oppose the phenomenon of uh, uh, relocation of uh, companies, uh, people moving to countries where uh, labor is cheaper, so outsourcing of labor? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, this is, I think, the key problem with everybody trying to emulate Germany's export growth strategy. Because what that does is lead to a race to the bottom where everybody keeps trying to cut their wages in order to remain as competitive as possible. And it's a zero-sum game because as one country lowers its wages more and more, manufacturing companies threaten to relocate to these uh, countries in order to uh, um, get much lower rates and then you get this re ongoing race to the bottom. So you need to uh, promote uh, policies which not only create job growth but rising income. The labor cost variable is the shortest and easiest way for many businesses to fatten their profit margins but it's ultimately very self-defeating because it does ultimately destroy demand. I should say that Germany ha has stopped trying to relocate its labor abroad because it finds where it has, for the German type of production, it has not had very good uh, success because the quality of labor abroad is nowhere near as good as German labor. So there's been a repatriation of industry towards uh, Germany. If you're a country that maintains a strong educational and training system, uh, the principle that the Americans discovered in the 19th century will operate. High wage labor undersells low wage labor because it tends to be more efficient uh, and productive labor. Well, it's not going to be very long yet because I can imagine many of you have to go back home, take planes, drive back, so we'd rather keep it short. Unfortunately, we have so many questions. There's one here. In, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, even going back to a sovereign money, there are still uh, so many organizations and institutions that are international that uh, affect our economy and our policy making, such as uh, the World Trade Organization, Bilderberg, uh, Trilateral Commission, the International Monetary Fund. So uh, how can we develop MMT in such a context? Uh. Again, while being not MMT, but uh, fellow traveler, my reply would be simple, ignore those international organizations. If you have the Lira, you have no need for aid from the World Bank or the IMF. two questions uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask them both at the same time and it's about uh, the creation uh, full employment uh, job creation don't you think this may lead to the paradox of where jobs are created that are completely useless in order to give a job to somebody and uh, uh, there may be the danger of uh, seeing uh, people just moving away from private jobs it's a it's a question we get asked often. The purpose of the public sector employment program is to find useful things for people to do. Things that need to be done anyway and aren't getting done. This is not a program that's designed to pay someone a wage to dig a hole and fill it back up. I mentioned the New Deal and I gave just a handful of examples of what was accomplished in the 1930s under those programs. I can assure you 
that in the U.S. and in Italy and in just about any country we put our finger on, there are more than enough useful things for people to do. There's no limit. We can find things that add value to society. This is not a make-work program. And to support Stephanie, I think that those who criticize those kind of programs ignore the metamorphose of capitalism in Europe. Capitalism in Europe, or the private sector, is no more capitalism according to Marx's expectations. It is a pure parasite system, which, I repeat, does not want anymore to hire people. They, when you discuss with them, they say people should understand that we do not need them. In the early 90s in Italy, the technical governments abolished the law dating back to 1936, according to which there was a ban on mergers uh, between commercial and investment banks. The question is, is it advisable to introduce this kind of separation in Italy? Yes. <laughs> well, at this point, I think uh, I'll take two questions with short answers. Uh, quite interestingly, especially for you who have uh, studied the history of money, is it true that uh, fiat money that has been described uh, throughout uh, the summit uh, is, uh, is it, has been there for ta from since time immemorial? It's been ex in existence for centuries. Uh, it's not a modern invention. Short answers, please. Uh, yes, it certainly has since Sumerian times in 30, uh, the third millennium BC. If you read Plutarch's Lives, he will describe how Sparta's money was made out of iron that was dipped in vinegar so that it could not be used. The word for coin, numismatics, comes from the Greek word nomos, which means created by law. Uh, so the history of the first uh, 4,000 years of money, from Sumer to Babylonia to Sparta to Greece to Rome, was that money is always given its value by government is be to the extent that government will accept it in payment for uh, public services or taxes. So all money is fiat money. Another question, very quickly. Have you already set the date for the next summit? Uh, <laughs> or uh, the next summit with us in Italy? <laughs> well, I am... Uh, uh, crazy about rules. I love rules. I think we should pay tribute to these people. They are really knackered. They've been working like crazy. They've traveled all the way from the States, uh, jet lag. They've been working morning, evening, afternoon, night, all the time. We should thank them a lot, but they need a bit of applause. And then I'd like to ask them to sit back again because I have a final address and they, are, of course, are important.